something great from that. Um, yes, it's, it's, sometimes you have a great idea, but sometimes you just start with a single character. And this, and this is the thing uh, uh, that I don't think is unique to playwriting, but the idea of, of creating characters that want things, you know? Um, the idea that, that like, you, can start with, you can start with a Hamlet, right? And you have no idea what world is Hamlet in, what, what, what they're doing. All you know is what they want. Hamlet wants to avenge his father, his father's death. Then you throw obstacles in his way, the obstacles get more and more interesting, and you start coming up with ideas on how you can, you can put Hamlet through, through the ringer, then you finally get to a climax, and at that climax, Hamlet is either going to avenge his father or he's going to fail, and then it falls off. None of that requires lengthy research, none of that requires lengthy, uh, lengthy uh, uh, lightning bolts in the night, you just have a whiny little kid who wants to avenge his father. The rest comes along the way. Um, and I think, and, and, uh, and uh, Dave and I were actually talking this, about this on the car ride over, um, that, I, I mean, there is no wrong process, but, but, but oftentimes, and this is, this is an example that, 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 I, that I take from directing, but I apply to writing a lot. And that is, and that is this, this idea of, of, of sort of preparation versus discovery. Um, the idea that, so there was this famous, uh, there was this famous director, uh, Peter Brooks, um, and he's, uh, he's famous because of lots and lots of plays he directed, but, but he also did the, uh, the, the black and white version of, um, of uh, Lord of Flies and did that Mahabharata that was on TV and anyway. Very, very famous guy. And he, and he talks about how the first directing gig he ever got, he got, he got in front of a, he, he wanted to prove himself. Like, everybody was going to be at this first rehearsal, and it was a huge cast, and it was the biggest thing he'd ever had. He said, I'm going to impress people, so I'm going to prepare so much for this rehearsal. And so he got out his little, his little, his little model of the set, and he put little figures on it. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to block the most complicated scene in the play. It's a 28-person party scene. And I'm going to block the dance and the fight and all this stuff. And he moved all of them around. He drew little diagrams. And he spent all night preparing for the next day. Then he gets in there, of course, and 28 people are there. And there's an actor with a limp. And there's an actor who holds himself in a peculiar way. And there's an actor who is hilarious because of, because of the way he speaks. And there's a character who has a list. And suddenly, all these things he had to consider were in the room. And it made all of his preparation useless. And maybe not useless. I mean, I'm, I'm overstating. I'm, I'm sure that there was something that came out of the preparation. But for the most part, he realized he had to scrap everything he did and just be in the room and, and use their, the ideas that were coming to him. Um, and I think for directors, and I think for writers as well, it's, it's finding that balance between preparation and discovery. It's fine to prepare, and it's fine to, you know, you're writing a thing about the Civil War, so you're researching the Civil War, right? Great, that's all really good. And you're, and you're looking at this character that, that was in the Civil War and, and all the things they did. But none of that should close you off from the wonderful discovery that you make in the process of writing. Because, I mean, that's where the magic happens, right? I mean, it's not the fact that this person was a general and they, and they had, did this many battles. And it's, your discovery that that person, that it, it's, it's, it's not a fact, but you, you discover that this person really, you know, likes pigeons, or I don't know, like the weird little details that, that, sort, of, that sort of come out in the, in, the, in the course of writing. And um, closing yourself off to that discovery through too much preparation can, be, can, can, can actually really get in the way of writing. Um, and then send you in the spiral of self-doubt and, and, and that, that, that whole thing that, that stops you from, from doing what you meant to do in the first place. Um, so, and that's all to say that, that you know, and, and that's, that's all to say that, that inspiration, while it, it, it can be a kindly monster, it can also be a monster that, that, that blocks us. Um, another thing that I do often um, to um, you know, when I when I don't have ideas, in, you know, in terms of inspiration, is, is I always go to I always go to two places, and no one has to do what I do, but but the two places I, I tend to go to are, are observation and architecture, and 
I, I talked a little bit about architecture, essentially, the, the idea that like when I don't have an idea, I just go to structure. I just say, OK, this is how a, this is how a plate is tend to shape it, it, it's shaped like this, and so and so I go to that place and, and try and build it like that. Um, but the other place I, I I go to is just through observation. Um, the idea that um, you know if you don't have an idea, then you're not opening your eyes enough. Just go out into the world, read the newspaper, look at, uh, look at the people walking down the street, um, because because it's all there. Um, the it's just a question of, of, of recognizing what in the world has those things that you need. What in the world has conflict, right? What in the world has, has, has rich characters? What, what has like a physical sort of, sort of theatricality? Um, the, these, these things are recognizing those things are important, but they're all there, and they're, and they're, and they're all for the taking. Um, actually, so, so a, play that, a play that I wrote uh, called Forgotten Kingdoms, um, is this good good example of where it sort of came alive for me through observation, and that is that so so my, my grandfather was a missionary um, in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore um, until Indonesia kicked out all the missionaries and then he settled in Singapore. Um, but I always thought my grandfather was this fascinating character. I always wanted to write a play about him because because I, I thought that there was so much sort of like interesting conflict in in, in who he was. Uh, because for me, there were, there was really two men there. There were there was there was the grand there was the warm and loving grandfather that I knew, and then there were the uh, there were the sort of things that I knew that he did as a missionary that I had a lot of sort of sort of uh, sort of moral problems with to, just in in the. Um, he didn't really tend to respect the cultures that he that he would go into, and, and um, went in with sort of a lot of um, sort of fire and brimstone in a way that didn't really sit that well with him. But so I had these two men, right? That, that you know, that, that, and, and that always sort of existed in conflict for me. And I always sort of wondered, you know, this idea of like trying to convince someone who already has a religion to take your religion. And I thought it was this fascinating thing. And, and in my mind, I always thought, if I was ever to write a play about him, it would be about the day that he met his match, the day that he tried to convert someone, and that person converted him. And so that sounds fine. Good. Like, it's a good sort of intellectual idea. But there's nothing, but like, there's no story there yet, right? I, I mean, I guess you put two people on the stage and just let them fight for a while. And, and I, you know, sometimes things come from that. But, the, but what did it for me, actually, was I actually went to visit the, uh, the town that he first went to in Indonesia, a small town that uh, was right on the water. And a lot of people in this town lived on, um, in, in buildings on stilts. And his house was a house that was on stilts over the ocean. It was about maybe a quarter of a mile from the mainland. It was that far. Um, and you, you would walk down this wooden plank, this wooden jetty, to get to this house. And sitting on the porch of that house, you could see the town in front of you. And you could, but you were but you were sitting on that porch. And I thought like how perfect it was for him, this idea that he was always apart from the village, but he was always but he was always watching it. And this idea that he could be sitting on this couch with someone in this engaged in battle um, while this churning sea. Was was below them, right? This this uh, the sea that 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 could sort of sort of like mimic their 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 anger and their and their back and forth. And I don't know, but there was something about the phys the physical world that, that inspired me to start. And so that's so that's where the, where the play began. It didn't begin with these two people. It began with uh, the local the local man walking down this jetty, walking down this jetty toward toward the man the man who was my grandfather. Um, and so yeah, so observation. Like the uh, inspiration doesn't necessarily come from a lightning strike, it comes from an actual physical tactile place, you know. Um, and again, you know, this is the and, and this and, and I'm talking from the perspective of a playwright, but I do think that this, you know, this idea of characters and, and conflict are are are, are very are very uh, uh, relevant to, to fiction and no, even nonfiction as well. Um, so yeah, um, and then and then of course the other the other thing that I that, that I fall back on is is, is architecture and structure. Uh, Edward Albee actually said this really this really wonderful thing once. He he said uh, uh, playwriting is poetry meets architecture, you know, and that's why I actually call it architecture because of, because of what he, what he said. And I like that idea that like 
you know, the poetry of the words meets the, the architecture of the argument. Um, I like it. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, the, the, other, the other thing that sort of comes in with self-doubt, um, I think, See, look, we're still only on monster number two. Um, the other thing that comes with self-doubt is uh, no one will ever read what I write. Yeah, I mean, this is this is this is this is a big, big uh, self-doubt thing. No one will ever, no one will ever read it. No one will ever produce it. No one will ever publish it. Um, no one will herald my talents to the world. Right? I have a story, but if I have a story, no one will read it. And I think that that's, that's a big thing. And it's probably, uh, you know, in, in, in doing sort of uh, panel discussions and things like that in front of audiences, often it's the first question that is asked. It, it, especially, you know, there'll be like a drama skilled meeting, and there'll be like three or four of us up in front, and then, and then we open it up to discussions. And often the, the first question is, why won't you produce my play? And this is a very real thing. And, and, and of course, this is, this is the thing that we all want, and especially in theater, because in theater, you know, your, your play isn't a play until actors say it and, and an audience is, is feeling it. But I think it's just really important uh, to, to realize, and I'm stealing this from, from Gary Garrison, who, who, who runs the Drama Skill, um, but it's important to realize that, that no one asked you to be a writer, you know? I, <laughs> I mean, they ask, that people ask you to be a lawyer, and they ask you to be a doctor, and, Ask you to be an electrician, and they ask you to be a waiter, you know. But nobody asked you to be a writer. This is something that you either want to do or you have to do. It's something that, that you're 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 driven to do. But no matter but no no matter what what your reasoning is for it, I, I don't know. I mean, this this life is hard. No no one no one owes you anything, and it's um, just because you put words on paper doesn't mean that they are going to want to read it. Now, the other reason I find this, this, this part of self-doubt particularly frustrating, and I say this from personal experience, I mean, um, because I am constantly saying, I have brilliant things. Why won't people put them on stage? Um, or why won't the right theater put it on stage? Um, but I find it frustrating also because because this, this, this concept, this idea of, of Sending your things out in the world and hoping someone will will pick up on it, right? Um, like like you actually started with all the with all the opportunities, right? All the all these contests that people could submit to, and the, and they're great. And sometimes people do uh, uh, pick up on it, but the but the idea is that I think that this 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 tendency sort of comes from this place of solitude, right? It comes from this particularly lonely place of of writing things in the dark, sending them out. And then being sad because no one, no one will bring you in. And this is where I, where, where, where I think that, that uh, is, is, is the third big monster, and that's loneliness. Um, and I think that, that writers, in a sense, are lonely, often are lonely by choice. We, we have this idea that, that, that we, write, we write in the dark, and that's, that's, that's what we do. But we're not in the dark here, right? I and mean, we're all here, and, and we have we have this, this wonderful community here that's 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 uh, that's that's here and ready to to uh, to see everything you guys do. Um, but it, it, all of this actually reminds me of. Are we? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm a musical accompaniment. Um, but all of this actually reminds me, and actually, uh, I, I just wrote this this blog post for for Arena Stage. Um, where, where, where I, I actually remember in college, in my intro to theater class. So I took this intro to theater class, and I still remember this uh, from what I guess is 20 years ago, that um, this description of what the playwright is. Like every chapter in the intro to theater textbook would, talk, would do a little character sketch of like what the lighting designer was like or what the director was like. And it would describe what that character was like. And I remember the, the description of the playwright was so hilarious, and it was so comically false. Um, I actually recreated it here for you. I, I have no real memory of what it actually said, but here's what, here's what, what, what I remember it saying. Um, and that is, 
A creature emerges from the darkness of the back of the theater, hair disheveled and skin pale, lack of sleep and preoccupation with ideas arcane. This creature has lost the ability to communicate and slumps in a chair beyond the perception of those rehearsing in the warm light of the stage. The creature clutches a chewed and dirty pen and takes notes furiously, mumbling and sighing as the rehearsal continues. That's not really what it said, but that's what I remember. Um, <laughs> And uh, but and I see this in, in like playwriting textbooks all the time, where it describes the playwright as this. There, there's another. There's actually a textbook that is a very good textbook that I use a lot. Um, that that actually talks about this idea of the uh, the playwright's alley. The, there's like this place in the back of the theater that's worn down because the playwright's pacing so much. And I think that's really all. This is really a terrible a terrible. Um, view of what a writer is, because I don't think a writer is passive in that way. And, and, and maybe theater is a little different, because theater is, is a, big, a big collaboration. But I, but I think that all writing is, is a collaboration. You know, I mean, I mean you look at you know, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland uh, would not have been The Wasteland without Ezra Pound, right? I mean, the, the, the collaboration and working together is, is all about what, what writing is about. And why I find the idea of, of, of people complaining about not having their, their, their works produced is this idea that like you're not actively trying to find your community, and the truth is that you're never going to get produced and you're never and you're never going to get published unless never say never. I mean, I guess there's geniuses out there, but for the most part, you need you need to build a community of either fellow writers or fellow artists or or something, and then that community grows and becomes something else. Um, because without that community. You're, you're going to not only shrivel up as a writer, but you also are just never going to get produced. You have to have, and it's not that dirty, that dirty word of networking or, or, or anything like that. It really is about creating relationships and creating collaborations with other people. And I think that that's, that's, that's one of the really, one of the, one, of the, one of the most important things that, that, that an artist and a writer has to do. 